Good morning. I welcome you in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. And I pray this morning as I share God's word with you, that you will find blessing and hope. But before we get to that, let us pray to you. Almighty God, we just thank you for your word and your love for us in Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, help us now as we come to hear your word that is read and preached to us. May, your, may this word transform our hearts and may your Holy Spirit grant us grace and wisdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I'd like to read to you from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Let us hear the word of God. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the king of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olives, Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had heard, and and when they had entered, they went up to the upper room, where they were staying. Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, all. These, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the woman and the Mary of and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. May God bless us, reading of His Word, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Book of Acts is the action book of the New Testament, and it constitutes, therefore, one of the most exciting books of the Bible. The full name of it is the Acts of the Apostles. But there are not many apostles mentioned in it. James, John, Peter and Paul are the only ones who appear here of any prominence. Through the centuries Christians have shortened this title and called it the Acts. I like that better. For this is the book of action revealing how God is at work through Christians. There is in there is intense conflict throughout the book, but a conflict met by a ringing confidence that is wonderful to see. It is a record of power exercised during persecution, an account of life and health pouring from a living Christ into a sick society through the channel of obscure men and women, very much like you and me. We could never, under, and we could never understand the New Testament if we, not, if we did not have the book of Acts for it fills the gap that would exist between the Gospels and the book of Romans which follows at the end of the Gospels we find a handful of Jews gathered in Jerusalem talking about a kingdom to come to Israel in the book of Romans we find an apostle who is not even mentioned in the Gospels and who was not one of the twelve writing to a band of Christians in the capital city of Rome talking about going to the ends of the earth. The book of Acts tells us how this happened and why this change occurred. The first 14 verses of chapter 1 
constitutes an introduction to the book of Acts, giving us the key to the book. Now we have revealed the essential strategy by which Jesus Christ proposes to change the world. A strategy which is the secret of the revolutionary character of the church when it is operating as it was intended to operate. The church is the most important body in the world today. Far and, be, far and away beyond every other body. Because whatever happens in the world happens because of something that is that is or is not happening in the church. We shall see this clearly in the book of Acts. The strategy is given in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1. In this first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he has taken up after he had given a commandment to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles whom he had chosen. The writer here is Luke, that beloved physician who accompanied Paul on his journeys. We do not know how he became a Christian, through, uh, though probably through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. He was Paul's company through danger, hardship, trial, endless difficulties up and down the length and breadth of the Roman Empire. He wrote two books of the New Testament, the Gospel according to Luke and the book of Acts. The one to whom this book is written is a young man named Theophilus. We don't know anything more about him than that. His name indicates that he was probably a young Greek, perhaps a new convert to Christianity whom Luke met somewhere and to whom he explains in these two books what Christianity is all about. It is strange that he is not mentioned elsewhere in Scripture, although someone with the name Theophilus might well tend to remain hidden mo in uh, most of the time. The name means loved of God, loved of God, and thus probably indicates that this young man was a Christian. We are indebted to this young man for sharing his letters with us, for otherwise we would not have the Gospel of Luke or the book of Acts. Now, in his first statement here, Luke gives us the great strategy by which the Lord works among humanity. He says, in the first book, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. The Gospel of Luke is the record of the incarnation of the Son of God. In John's words, he said, the word, be, the word made flesh who came and dwelt among us. Jesus the man came to begin something, to do and to teach. And the record of that beginning is in the Gospels. But by clear implication, this second book is the continuation of what Jesus began to do. It is in very real sense. Acts is not the acts of Christians, but the continuing acts of Jesus. It is an account of what Jesus continues to do and to teach. In the Gospels, he did it in his physical body of flesh. In the, in the book of Acts, he is doing it through the bodies of men and women who are indwelt by his life. Thus, whether in the Gospel, in the Gospels or in Acts, incarnation in human flesh is the sweet is the secret strategy by which God changes the world. Whenever God wants to get a message across to humanity, He does not simply send someone to announce it. His final way of driving it home is to dress the message in flesh and blood. He, he takes a life and aims it in a certain direction and by the manifestation of His own life through the blood and flesh of a human being, He makes clear what He has to say. That is the strategy of the book of Acts. It is the record of incarnation, men and women possessed by Jesus Christ, owned by him and thus manifesting his life. That is the secret of true Christianity. Anytime you find a, a Christianity that is not doing that, it is false Christianity. No matter how much it may adapt the dress and language of Christianity, if it is not the activity if, if it is not the activity human beings possessed and indwelt by the life of Jesus Christ, it is not authentic Christianity. That is the true power of the church, as we shall see in this book. 
The book of Acts, therefore, is an unfinished book. It has never been ended, but it is still being written. The book abruptly closes with an account of Paul in the city of Rome, living in his own hired home. It just ends there as though you might turn over the next page and begin the next adventure. This book is volume one, and we are writing in the 21st century, volume 21 now. It may well be the last volume in the series. The Greek word for proof here is a word that includes the idea of being convinced, being convincing, infallible, as the King James Version has it. Luke gives us three categories of these proofs. He does not give us the detail which you will find in any other place. He lists the three categories of proof that Jesus Christ is alive. As you will know from the very earliest centuries and throughout the 20 centuries of Christendom, we have accounts of the enemies of Christianity who tell us that the appearances of Jesus were really nothing but hallucinations. They occurred only in the imaginations of those disciples and that he was not really, not really there. But says Luke, let me show you the three categories of proof that he was risen. Firstly, he appeared to them for 40 days. The word here is, uh, the word here is one from which we get our word of thilmaya. Of thilmia. That is the word for the eye or literally the eyeball. If, it were to use, if we were to use the modern vernacular, what Luke says is these disciples eyeballed him for 40 days. They saw him again and again, not merely once, but many times during this period. Each time he looked the same, it is hard for an hallucination to accomplish this. Secondly, he spoke to them, speaking of the kingdom of God. Why, says Luke? We even remember his subject matter. He talked about the kingdom of God. We saw him and heard him. Two objective, sensual experiences that confirmed to us that he was no fantasy and no hallucination. And thirdly, the ultimate proof was he ate with us. The word staying here has a marginal reference which gives eating as the actual Greek word used. He ate with us, says Luke. And those who were there saw him eat. They saw the food disappear. It is surely terribly hard to get a hallucination to eat. Luke says, this is proof he ate with us so we know he is alive. This wonderful fact of the resurrection of Jesus is the bedrock upon which all Christian faith ultimately rests. Anytime you are troubled with doubts or under attack for your faith, come right back to this fundamental fact. The Apostle Paul, remember, holds it up for us and says, in effect to the enemies of Christianity, look, if you want to destroy our faith, then disprove this fact. In all, it all rests on this. If Christ is not risen, then our faith is in vain. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 17. Throughout the centuries, many attempts have been made to disprove the resurrection of Jesus, but none has ever been successful. In fact, oftentimes the ones attempting this have themselves become, have become convinced by the evidence to have become Christians. It is, in, it is in fact number one upon which the strategy of manifestation rests. And while staying with them, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but before many days you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that your Father has fixed by his own authority but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth literally what Jesus said to these 11 disciples Judas now having left them was stick around in Jerusalem that is the literal Greek expression stick around don't go outside the city until the promise of the Father has come upon you why? Because you'll make a mess of it if you try witnessing without him. This is, a, this is an essential. 
You cannot be an effective Christian if you're not operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. Every attempt made to advance the cause of Christianity, which does not arise from that source, only destroys the message God wants to convey. It is absolutely essential, Jesus says to the men of that time. So don't try anything without it. Just wait, for in a few days you will receive the promise of the Father. As a church, we are not called into a ritual, but to life itself, to Christ's reality. It is also not a program, but power. These disciples said to him, Lord, are you going to at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They were thinking in terms of timetables, schedules, and programs. What are you going to do when this is all going to happen? How is this going to happen? The Lord Jesus said, this is not for you to know. Times, schedules, and programming is not for you to know. That is all in the Father's authority. Your task is to be the manifestation of power, not the knowledge of a program. The Father will take care of that. You, you content yourself with exercising the power that is given to you, and the Father will put it all together and work it all just right. There has been the mistake of the church. The church has thought it had the task of programming the work of God, that it was up to us to set up timetables and establish the structures and framework by which the work would go on, to carry it all out consistently and systematically across and around the world. But we have never been able to do it. The reason is because that is not our authority. The times and seasons are not for us to know. The Father has kept that in His own authority. But He said, though I am not letting you know the program, I will give you power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And what I like about this word power, if you look in the Acts chapter 1, uh, and, and that verse where it speaks about power, it's called the dynamos. It's the Greek word for being dynamic. It's the Greek word for meaning a dynamic power. Finally, what kind of power? This is a most wonderful thing. It is resurrection power. Not Eskim power, which is on and off, but it is resurrection power that brings eternal life. It is the power of a risen Lord. Resurrection power, a different kind of power. It is not dem demonstrative or spectacular it is a quiet power. It is the kind of power that never makes any kind of demonstration. Most kinds of power that we know make some kind of sound. They hum or buzz or throb or pulsate or pound uh, or explode or something. But this kind of power does not. It is quiet. But though it is quiet, it is irresistible. There is no way to oppose it, no way to overthrow it, no way to stop it. Every obstacle thrown in its path is but turned into an opportunity to advance. You can find many demonstrations of that in the Gospels and in church history. Today some of us are watching a demonstration of this in our local scene where certain attempts are being made to resist the working of the Holy Spirit. Every attempt thus made is but opening the door wider, for this is resurrection power at work. Therefore, in conclusion, here in this introduction, we have all the elements that make up the book of Acts. Our risen Lord, whose life is made available through the coming of the Spirit, and who will come again in power and great glory. This is the book of Acts. This is the life of the church. These are what makes any group of Christians have an impact and exercise a vital revolutionary force in the age in which we live. Amen. Heavenly Father, guide and keep us as we trust in you in this week. Transform our lives through this resurrection power and may we be a people of power and grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. May you have a wonderful week. May God bless you and keep you in all that you do. Goodbye.